Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here in my shop where I'm just about to start work on this kind of beat up Viking AM broadcast radio. Uh, I don't know anything about it other than supposedly it works. And of course, those statements are pretty vague and it can mean all kinds of stuff. So I have no idea what condition this is in. So let's look it over. I mean, right off the bat, this is not eye candy. Um, this is pretty ugly looking. It's, it's really dirty. And uh, there's the whole trim piece here is all scuffed up, something terrible, especially down here. I'm looking more for damage on here. There, there really isn't any damage as such. What about this piece? Other than dirt, I think, um, you know, and, and this uh, paint being knocked off here. I think it looks really good. Now, can you see? that whoever made this piece around here there's a piece right here this is a separate piece and uh, there's a cut through here and this is pieced in interesting didn't quite get it perfect here I spotted it looks like other than that they would normally make make these in four corners that's what it looks like but something happened here and they pieced the piece in. Okay, that's not going to affect the radio's operation. Here we go. Disconnect power cord before removing chassis. Canadian Standards Association sticker on it. Broadcast and phono. What's this doing back here? This looks like a speaker grill. Is a speaker on the back? a little flimsy. Well, that's interesting. I'm guessing the speaker does face out the back. This back is heavy duty. This is a thick piece of board here. It's not your super light guy. I'm looking at the screws to see they're all there and they're all the same kind. Oh, one's missing here. So that's a hint. Somebody's been in here. This actually isn't fitting quite right in here. This looks... This looks gap here in the cabinet. Um, on the trim there's a few little pieces knocked off here on the back trim. So on the side of it, it's got paint on it. Every good radio has paint specs on it. Yeah, there's paint specs up on the top here. No radio gets through a long life without getting some specs of paint on it. That's what I think. Mean. So the cabinet's actually in very good shape. A little bit of wear here. Um, there isn't even any serious uh, water staining or somebody's put a plant on top and it's left a circle. Nothing like that. There's just a lot of dirt on there. That's great. Um, let's take the back off. What's this say here? It says ACDC operating operated radio model number EMU61-417 Wow, that's a long model number. 37 watts. The serial number is almost 150,000. So, does that mean there's 150,000 of these out there? Okay, it's a simple matter of taking the screw out. These look like combo Robert's green square head and a flat head. So that, that suggests to me that this, whoops, 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 this uh, radio may have been manufactured in Canada but sold into the States. So uh, Americans don't have these uh, square handled screwdrivers that all Canadians have. We love our square screws. So what it is, this is a square headed screw with a slot cut across it. So you can do it. So, so either Canadian or American can do this. If you want to read an interesting history about uh, screwdrivers, or if you think <laughs> if you think some screwdriver history might be of interest to you, look up Roberts screwdriver. I think it's Roberts. Maybe it's Robertson. Shame on me. And you read the history of this great Canadian screw that the Americans would not adopt. 
That's why we've got these square head screws. And our American friends have those uh, star screws that I hate so much. That's still pretty solid. Can I get them all out? Yeah. Okay, so I don't hate American screws. <laughs> what's going on here? Is there a whole radio coming out? Is that what's happening here? I think, I think, I think, I think, maybe... Just, oh, only one, one hold screw here. With a speaker mounted on the back plate, there's a good chance. Oh yeah, the whole thing just relaxed here. Okay, uh, the back plate is bolted directly. It's a strong, a strong plate too. It's bolted directly to the chassis. I'm pretty sure of that. You get a chance to look under here. No schematic. It's got feet. All four feet are still there. Very unusual. So I'm feeling if there's anything sharp in these, like a piece of dirt or something, because these are really skid up your uh, your table. These are not put on very well. This one's on an angle. I, I wonder if somebody put these on after the fact, and this was the original foot feet. Legs, I guess. <laughs> okay, I got some knobs to take off here. Oh, just fell right off. Okay. Asbestos, lots of dust. It's very unusual uh, how they've done this this grill work here. And then this tape over here. It's very unusual. I don't think I've ever seen a radio with the speaker coming out the back like this, except. Uh, my, uh, my, my Gonset radio here in the shop is the same way, but that's a communications receiver. There's no antenna inside. Doesn't look like anybody ever did anything in here. You can kind of see how the front is screwed in. Oh, there was something here. Paper. Nothing spectacular going on there, but it's in good shape. Good solid shape. Now, what do we got happening here? We've got this oh so ugly light here. Um, all the tubes are here. Everybody's here. It's got a bottom plate. So we can't peek under quickly. Let's take the bottom plate off and see what's going on inside so we know what we're operating here. How do you get this off? Oh, these, these, these must be screwed in from above or something. So, okay, a little greeny square head screwdriver. I understand sometimes furniture made in Canada that is sold in the States or electronic equipment or other stuff like that, um, made with these square head screwdrivers. When you buy it, you get you get a screwdriver with it. Yes, the, to 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 make a square hole in the screw head, you have to use a special double strike technique that was uh, patented by the uh, guy who invented this system. And what is the whole deal with it? That is the whole deal. See the screw there. Hanging right on. And here we go. What do we got? Oh, yeah. Okay. Here's what we got. 
we've got a radio full of paper capacitors. Oh my gosh, look at them all. But they do appear to be in pretty good shape. For crying out loud, we got a rectifier here. It doesn't look so good. Some of the plates look darkened. And we got these capacitors that somebody has stuck in there. Obviously, to, to kill the hum. Is there anything really bad looking? There's a high wattage here, a high wattage there, and a high wattage here. Another one down here. Uh, they all look to be in pretty good shape, though. You know, the cord's been replaced. So there's nothing leaping out here, except this guy makes me a little nervous. What's he in there for? Don't they have a rectifier tube in this radio? What's that little rectifier for? There's no rectifier tube. I think these are two output tubes here. Two output tubes. They have one, two, three, four, five, six tubes, but no rectifier. So we'd see some kind of almost direct connection to this guy if he's the power rectifier. I don't know what else it would be. It's pretty large. Occasionally these radios have a separate negative supply for the grid, but that would be very unusual. I mean, especially in a small radio. They might, might find one of these tucked in to, to, to rectify for bias voltage, but that's unusual. Some of these plates appear to have moved. They don't, they're not perfectly lined up. This is this is quite a bolted structure here. I think if I loosen off this nut, all these plates would fall right off it. That's a little unusual. So it's very heavily attached to to to, to ground here. Let, let me get the close-up camera going because it, so this is uh, this requires a little closer look. Oh, hang on tight. So here we are. See, I think if I just loosen that nut, all these plates would just fall apart because you see they're not they're not even lined up perfectly. Never never seen one kind of sloppy like that. It's going to generate heat. It's going to heat this capacitor up. Is there any sign that this capacitor has been cooked? You can drip a wax down here. Not particularly. So the word on the street is if you let one of these guys fail uh, in your house, uh, you're going to regret it. That's, that's the word on the street. Be the positive terminal there, and the resistor tied to it back there. Resistor coming. Oh, look at those strands of wire. Whoa, what is happening there? What are those strands doing there? Yow. I don't think they're doing a good thing. A lot of the soldering looks like it's cold solder too. It just it doesn't look like it got hot enough. Let me let me get those strands out of there. We're gonna operate this radio. Let's see if I can do this on camera here. Wow. So that's the problem with stranded wire. For sure they come from here though. Just a little hard doing this holding the camera the way I'm doing it. There. 
Okay, so if there was a drop problem there, there isn't now, but uh, it probably wasn't short, but it was close. Uh, let's look the whole thing over. There's some high wattage resistors there. So I, I always look at these high wattage resistors to see if they've darkened. Uh, these haven't, so and all these wax capacitors look pretty good actually. Yeah. So this is a 450 volt, that's a little bit overkill there. 40 microfarads, a little under size, what's this one? This guy looks pretty small. Come on, you, you hit the numbers here. A 250 volt, okay, that's better. 33, eh, maybe a little bit small. And look at the uh, solder job here, it's left some more strands hanging around. It's a classic problem here. You see how these are floating out here? They're not too bad actually, but uh, because he's used a short, stiff lead here to, to fix it in place. Um, when you replace the uh, original capacitors you often end up with the no terminals to work with and that's this is one solution just float them out here okay let's just keep going down there's another no I thought those were strands but those are just pieces of the cloth Two bases can give you a hint on how much mileage is on the radio too because they get dark from long periods of operation. These don't look very dark. So the radio looks rough on the outside. Uh, not so rough on the inside here. Ooh. Okay, so here's a coil. It's kind of high up in the back of the radio here. Looks like it's been knocked. Maybe not. Maybe not. That's where the wax is missing here. Looks okay. There's another one. So this is probably the antenna coil. Where's the antenna? Hey man, where's your antenna? There's a connection to the chassis. It's been redone. It's a resistor. So that's a 40, that's a 27, that's a 270K resistor. It's probably paralleled with this large capacitor. Large capacitor and resistor are tied to the chassis. So the purpose of this connection, without, without looking, I'm going to say something. Okay, this is probably the only connection to the chassis in this radio. It's a combination fairly large capacitor and a resistor. Its purpose is to try to ground this chassis without grounding it. So they want to, they want to ground it for AC purposes, for uh, signal purposes, radio signal purposes, they want it grounded back to the negative bus or the B minus bus inside the radio, B minus terminal. So the other side of this is probably going to exactly that. Going to the this is probably the B minus terminal right here, or a place where. See a lot of capacitors are heading there. They aren't actually heading there, are they? Yeah. Lots of stuff heading to this terminal here. So this is your major B minus point, I think. Especially if we see a power supply wire coming to that. Um, now wait, if we go back up to this rectifier again. Yeah, there's a back terminal there. Wow, do you think that's electrically connected right through? 
this uh oh yeah well I can't can't really be sure what I'm seeing there let's get a little more light on it if we can well we'll check with the ohmmeter and find out what the situation is with this connection to the chassis oh wait a minute there's a whole bunch of soldered stuff over here so definitely this is you can't you can't see it in the camera, but I can see it with my eyes. Okay, so there's more than one connection to the chassis. There's probably more in here if we, if we look hard. Let's look at these terminal strips here. So I'm just trying to get into my head, you know, the the idea, <laughs> the ideas of this radio. So here we see a terminal strip. Uh, the holding terminals or the, or the holding brackets are, are not terminals. Nothing grounded here. Well, I shouldn't say that. Nothing grounded through those riveted terminals, and they're not soldered back. I notice the capacitor is up on rubber grommets. It's because the frame of the capacitor is going to be at B minus voltage. Well, if you're going to connect it to the chassis directly, two things happen. One, you might be introducing the chassis as a lousy antenna picking up lousy stuff you don't want to hear well you certainly be opening up this radio to a dangerous uh, situation with uh, um, voltage on the chassis because this is this is a uh, transformerless radio right? there's no transformer here anywhere it's transformerless that's another hint of that is this gigantic 120 volt light bulb one of the difficulties in a radio that has all the tubes in series, the heaters are in series, as there's no transformer producing heater voltage. And the result of that is often there's just no place to hook up a light for it to get six volts or whatever it is you want. You end up doing this, the Christmas light bulb thing, 120 volts. It's not a big deal, it's just a deal. I could probably put a uh, uh, an LED version of a light bulb in there. I wonder if I have one. Okay, back underneath. Well, I'm not seeing any particular reason to not try this radio out and see how it works. Yeah, let's do that. Let us do that. Now, talking about the antenna, which I was. Here it is, here. This gigantic bundle of wire. So that, that's the antenna connection. It immediately goes through a capacitor for safety purposes. So again, this, this wire is not actually attached directly to the chassis or B- minus or anything. There's lots of uh, safety issues with these non-transformer power supply radios. Not sure why I just undid that. Why did I do that? I don't want this spilling all over the place. Okay, power cord. This is pretty new, so it's not likely to have any problems on it. So in my uh, shop, when I'm plugging in radios like this into this, this is in case you're you're new to my videos and that um, this is not plugged straight into an outlet. This is going through a transformer to the outlet, and what that does is it provides isolation here on my bench. I'm a little less likely to get a shock. Okay, and it's not. 100% safety, nothing is, nothing is 100% when it comes to uh, safety in a shop like this. The main thing is knowing what you're doing. It doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as you know what you're doing. <laughs> do you know what you're doing? How do you know? How do you know you know what you're doing? Well, you start out by saying, I don't know what I'm doing. You can't be wrong about that. Ready now? Let's check uh, on off. Switched off, tuning, tuning, rubbing it a bit, but it's tuning. 
Are we ready? Let me put this up on a block. It'll be a little more steady. And uh, then the tuning capacitor will, will be clear. Good. Steady. More or less. What should we look at? Why don't we look at this? Okay, one second. My, my computer has demanded my attention here. Okay, you know, along with the, uh, the isolation transformer I'm using, I also use a dim bulb system. And all this is is putting a couple of light bulbs in series with the item you're testing. It's these two light bulbs. I'm loosening one so only one light is in. Because maximum current restriction is a pretty small radio. So what we should see now when I turn it on if all things are working right, this light should come on. The voltage at the radio won't be 120. It'll be something reduced, probably probably 100 volts, something like that. I'm not sure. At first, the tube heaters will draw a fair bit of current for a second or so. And during that time, the, this light will come on fairly bright, relatively bright. It will dull down fairly quickly. And then it should stay dulled down for a little while while the heaters heat up. In this radio, the high voltage is generated using a, uh, sil a uh, uh, solid state rectifier. So there will be high voltage available instantly when I turn it on. So once the tubes, uh, tubes heat up, uh, heaters uh, heat up and start conducting, the extra current draw on the radio will show up on that light bulb again. We'll see the light come up a little bit. That tells us that this radio has gone through its warm-up stages properly. If anything else happens with that light bulb, something's wrong with the radio. If I turn this on and that light bulb comes on full tilt, then there's a really big short inside the radio. Okay, I think we're ready. Switch is off. Okay, I have, I have a little switch panel up here. I have a master switch. And then I have a selector switch that selects down to turn on these lights or to run the power through these lights or up and this guy gets 120 volts. And I also have this meter over here which will tell us the voltage also. It's a little bit of overkill in my shop here because I even have more meters telling us the voltage. <laughs> I have this guy. I have more. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Let's fire him up. Okay, for, so nothing, so what should happen now? Nothing should happen because the radio is turned off. Gives me a chance to see what full voltage is today, 124.5, which is uh, pretty high. That's that's pretty darn high. Now my little transformer can be boosting it a little bit. So that may not be what's in my outlet, but uh, that's, that's almost high enough to complain to the uh, hydro company. Okay, there we go. Power on. Now, don't block the lights. Don't block the lights. Let's do it like this. Okay, let's switch on. Watching the one light on the right. On. Down. Okay, I didn't even know. I don't know if that came on camera. It's, it's, you can still see a faint glow. Way down. Okay, we should start hearing the radio any time now. Voltage at the radio is 110. That's more than enough for it to operate. The volume's turned down, so maybe that's why we're not hearing it. Oh. Well, sounds like a radio. It's turned up a little bit. Doesn't, 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 doesn't sound like a good radio to me. See? Works. So with the low end of the band, it's got to be on the left. We're going to pick up stations. We're going to pick them up up in this area here. Oh, there's definitely problems in here.
loose tube. Okay, I don't want to put my finger on the chassis here. Now, because this is an isolation joint, I can isolation transformer, I should be able to put my hand on the chassis and touch anything in the shop here and never get a shock. I'm not going to try. Okay, let's see what we got here. We got, we, oh. Everybody under the sun is, is it's all this noise here. So that hum sound, which to me is what sounds like a high impedance where there shouldn't be one, um, that didn't change at all during that malarkey. Interesting. I'm just thinking about what I, what I, what I should do uh, with this. I'm not picking anything up yet. Oh, that helps. Yeah, okay, let's let's use it. And we'll now throw out the antenna. Okay. There we are. Not bad. Now, oh, how hot is this thing getting? Okay, let's see if anything's getting hot in the back of this radio. Okay, so anything about uh, 70 degrees should show red on the screen here. This resistor, 45 degrees, that's not bad. I'm looking for anything red on here. Bright red. Now we're con concerned about this guy here. this you see on the screen right now that temperature is about 40 45 so it's not screaming hot I don't have to panic about it so let me shut it off here wow so it's another case of a working radio full of original parts except for this and that crummy hum. That crummy hum. That might be tricky to hunt down. I'm guessing it's just in the audio circuits and nowhere else. That means we could pull out the. Uh, we could pull out probably this guy here. What is he? I have a tube layout chart anywhere? I don't think one showed up. I think this, I'm going to guess, this will be the detector tube. 12SJ7. 12SJ7. Let's just take a quick look. I'm not familiar with that tube. 12SJ7. Well, this J7 here it is here. Sharp cutoff pentode used as a biased detector or high gain audio amplifier in ECDC radio receivers. So this is definitely the detector. Okay. So I've taken that tube out. This set won't work, of course, Jim. What are you doing? You can't you can't pull out a tube and operate this guy? <laughs> yeah, we'll put him back in. So that experiment can't be done because all these tubes are in series, tube heaters. OK, 
thing we'll do, we're going to pull all these tubes out and put them back in. Just to refresh the uh, tube contact here. Nice. It's just fine. Oh, SK seven. And what? What is this? This tube. This is a. Uh, I'm sure that says V, but it looks weird. Let's do this one. This is a 35L6. Hmm. Okay, 35L6. What's this one? Oh yeah, I can see it there. I was looking in the wrong spot. 35L6, so two 35L6s. So, how's this work? Here's another tube down here I didn't pull out. Come on. Ah, yeah. 12 SA7 appears to be in good shape, too. So, how would this work now? We have two 35s. So that's 70 volts, and then you basically got 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 and 70 is 110. So it's actually 115, yeah, so that adds up. So these are all in series. They must all draw the same current. Um, probably 150 milliamps. Probably. So that hum uh, could be from one of these tubes, unfortunately. <laughs> Say, didn't I learn that lesson a couple of amplifiers ago? I hunted for a hum for a while and then eventually tracked it down to one of four output tubes. So we can even start right there. Um, if we can eliminate that, that buzzy hum, I think the radio is done. I think I would leave it just as it is. I uh, would still give some consideration to uh, putting a uh, silicon diode in here. Get, get rid of this guy. He might cause the hum too, I think. Um, I think if the uh, internal voltage drop gets too high in here, it almost goes without saying that I should I should re uh, bypass this or replace it. It's the same problem with the as with the big capacitors. If you don't use this, you lose the terminals that are on it. There's busy terminal here and one up there. You have a well. Maybe I can take it right out and use the uh, hole. No, you know what they did here? They have they have soldered right right to the end of the screw that's coming through here. I believe that the head of it is soldered on the other side. So I don't think this is coming out. Uh, I think I'll test the tubes. I think, I think that's probably the best move next. Okay, so the first tube we're going to do are the two output tubes, the 35L6s. Let's just double check to make sure I have this right. 35L6. Filament voltage 35. Signal level 8. Bias 14H. Switches are 07345. 07345. 0610. 0610. 43. Sensitivity D for the plate. We're ready to go. Now I've been testing hundreds and hundreds of tubes through this tube tester and another one I have, and I'm literally wearing out these tube tester sockets in doing this. So, uh, how many tubes can you test in a tube tester before the sockets wear out? 
thousand, fifteen hundred. I don't know. Oh, I'm not gonna get anywhere for that. Wow, I got my headphones on. That was a big pop in the headphones. Okay, I can see it heating. Of course, we know we know these tubes work. Now, maybe one of them has a short, and that's where that hum is coming from. So let's look. This is a good tester to look for shorts. Nothing showing up on this tube. Okay, and let's see, the mutual conductance should measure at 990 on the scale there. Okay, so right, well, 990, right at 1,000. Right at 1,000, bingo. So this guy, now that's the rejection point. So actually indicating, or this, this test is showing this these, that tube to be near the end of its life. But, uh, you know, considering an old radio like this, how much is going to be operated? Almost not at all. Uh, it, these things can survive at the end of their life for another couple decades, probably. It's not really the end of their... You know what? They're in retirement, so it's different. In retirement? Okay. And what about you? Almost the same. Actually, it's still coming up a touch, so both tubes testing the same. I guess that bodes well for some kind of balance. Okay, so I'll set up for the next tube here. Okay, I think we're ready on this tube. 12SJ7. 12SJ7. 13. Filament voltage, signal level 2. Bias 25 low 17251 1, 7, 2, 5, 1, I suppose any tube with a uh, short between the heater and a tube element, it could, could produce that kind of hum we were hearing. Okay, and this guy is supposed to test up at just over a thousand. So it's weak. It's still coming up, but it's weak. Remember these numbers, the thousand is the rejection point. So you can't make it to a thousand. It's not good to use this tube. But the radio works. Let's just look at things like that. That makes almost no difference. But I'm not that inaccurate. What was it supposed to be? 40, 45. Right there. So, yeah, but it works. It's just, it's just not as, what do you call it, a spring chicken? Okay, we're ready now for the 12 SQ7, 12 SQ7, 13, signal level 1, 18L, 25100, 25100, 37603760, 37, right on, pop them in. A little click there. So of course this is the uh, uh, detector tube. So the first thing we're testing is the triode amplifier in it. No shorts. This triode amplifier should show up at about almost 800. Ooh, that's low. That that is mighty weak on here. That's two weak tubes now. 12 SQ7 is really quite weak. Let's just check again. The sensitivity? No. Let me move over here. Not really. Nothing, nothing's going to save it. 12 SQ7 weak. Let's do the diode side just for interest's sake. So to do the diode we change to uh, 2013P. Two 
file. Oh, 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 oh. I like that. Two thousand thirty. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Two zero one. I better check this. One three p. And oh seven six zero. Oh seven six zero. Forty eight. Is that correct? No. This is a diode test. 2013P. 2013P. 0760 0760048. Bias not an issue. A for the plate. Good show. Let's see if the diode works. Of course, the radio works, so the diode must have worked. No, it must have worked. Shorts. Nothing showing for diodes and rectifiers. It's this button and diode. Just got to get up above this, above this little thing there. Barely, oh, it's barely making it. So this looks like a case of the cathode is worn out on this tube. So this guy is weak in all respects. So I'm gonna... What was that? So that pop you just heard, I can't believe it. Um, I think that was a static discharge from me into the radio chassis. 12 SK7. 12 SK7. So I don't normally have my headphones on while I'm in here working, uh, but I'm wearing them right now, so I'm hearing exactly what is going on in the video, which I don't normally hear. So it's like clicks and pops that I miss all the time. 13, 2, 10 L, let's see if I can do this quickly, 17251, 1, 7, 2, 5, 1, Hold on, wrong two. One seven two five one. One seven two five one, that's correct. Four six three oh. Four six three oh is that I was using the wrong numbers, but the wrong numbers were the same. Forty four. C there you go. Shorts. Nope. So this guy, 12 SK7, 1520. So it should come right up in this, right up to the middle of the. It's weak too. How come everybody's weak? Let's just check the line voltage here, but I can't imagine it's. Not, it's actually set high. If anything, I've been helping the tubes out here. Hmm. So that is supposed to reject at 1520. What's it doing? It's jumping around. Okay, hold still. So I don't know if that's the tube socket or the tube. I got it almost all the way up now. No, 15 is way up in the middle here. So this, this is testing low also. Wow. Got a lot of weak tubes in here. So can these tubes get weak just sitting around doing nothing? Just sitting? I don't think so. I, uh, you know, they could be leaking air. That's possible. 12 SA7. Um, So, no, I would think any any weaknesses from use. 13, 2, 9 L. Usually it's a cathode uh, giving up. 2, I'm sorry, 2, 7, 3, 4, 5. 2, 7, 
three, four, five. One six five oh. One six five oh. Forty five. All kinds of things can happen to the cathode. Uh, materials can be uh, coming off the cathode. Uh, other materials can be collecting onto the cathode, interfering with its operation. All kinds of stuff happens inside these tubes. C, and we're done. 1100 whole tube, 12 SA7. Now, just before I hit the switch, and I was talking while I was doing this. 27345, 27345. 1650, 1650, 9L. Good. How about this tube? You gonna do it for us here? Uh, this one should come up 1100, 1100. Whoa! How do you explain that? That's double 1100. Explain that because something isn't set right. 12 SA7. Signal level 2, bias 9L, 27345, 27345, 1650, 1650, 45. She's just really good. So the numbers on here are the rejection point. They don't state what a good tube should test at. So maybe that's just a good tube. So I'm left with a couple of duds here, one in particular. So I will hunt down the uh, replacements I need here for these two tubes. And we'll try to set again with a better, better tubes in place. I'm sure these output tubes are okay. We did not find anything that suggested where that hum might come from in these tubes. No short circuits anywhere. Okay. Okay, let's see if all this tube testing I've been doing is going to pay off now. So, here's my 12 SQ7s and 12 SK7s. I have a lot of these particular tubes. Let's look in here first. So, the, the way I've done this, just, just in case you're curious, somehow we've managed to collect this many 12 SK7s. I put a serial number on each one of them, this is number 15, and then I have a computer record that I've kept for all these tubes. So I can simply look at the, it's all been tested, and I've kept track of all the results, which is why I serialized them. So if I want a good 12 SK7, I'll just pop over and look at my chart here. So this is my spreadsheet for uh, 12 SK7 and 6 SK7, and 12 here, 6 there. That's my estimate of the value of these tubes, 10 bucks. So um, here's the test results. So you can see 12 SK7 tube number one tested at 2700, and on the west end, the reject point is 15. So that's, these are all testing really, really good. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Either. On the Stark, it's 1200, and I did a few on the Stark, so here's one that's not so good. We just gotta pick one of these. Pick number one. Might as well. We'll pick tube number one of the 12 SK7. Okay, so, tube number one. Here we are. I've got it. Let's look at the other box here. 12 SK7. You see, it says bag three and bag four. It has nothing to do with the 12 SQ7. Bag 3 and Bag 4 are essentially random tubes. Maybe I've only got one of each kind, maybe two. And I just bag them up randomly, write a bag number, bag number 4, and then I have a record of what is in bag number 4. It's not, not the best way to go, but it's better than nothing. Now here's some 12 SQ7s, but these are the older style. 12 12 Q7, that must be this one. Is it the S? This is a little bit of education. Oops, I don't like you're looking. Uh, 12 Q7 is this tube with this pin on the top, with the uh, cap. 12 SQ7, same tube. S stands for single ended, no cap, no cap. 
Instead, they're using another pin down here. What, why why do they ever have these caps? I, I, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it was easier to build them or something. I don't know. But that's a that's what the S is, single ended. So that's that bag. This is bag three. And now we get down to my actual 12 SQ7s. And we'll check my record here. So this is a record of uh, 12 SQ7s. I did extensive testing uh, through all these different testers. Uh, the Ico, the Weston, and the Stark tester, and I think, is it my other, my last one? Maybe not. And what I was doing here was testing all the tubes through all these testers to compare all the results. Uh, back when I was very curious about tube testers. So what we're really interested in though is the 12 SQ7, one that tests for, what about number one? Number one. So the Stark says, get rid of it at 630, you should expect at least a thousand on a good tube. And look, it's 1100. So we'll take 12 SQ7 tube number one again. SQ7 tube number one. So the reason I'm taking the time to, to show you this is uh, just so you see how I'm handling a somewhat messy random set of tubes. Where's number one? There is no number one. What's happened to tube number one? Okay, well, tube number one's gone. <laughs> Look and see what other one could we grab? Tube number, we wouldn't want tube number two. We could take four. Tube number four, or let's, let's try tube number 10. Yeah, let's go for tube number 10. I'm not picking the best one. I don't want to pick the best tube I have in there. There it is, tube number 10. There we are. So as it turns out, I have some, I'm not finished yet. I've still got a lot more tubes to test. I have somewhere around a thousand good tubes. That's, that's So it appears at this point. And I probably rid or, or weeded out probably 200 to 250 bad tubes, dead tubes and bad tubes. Okay, let's pop those in and see what happens. Okay, so I put the replaced tubes in here and here. And I think we're ready to try it again. Volume down. So I think I'm gonna unscrew this light here. That's all it took. Pretty weird looking at the speaker facing the wrong way. That's that's an unusual thing. Speaker out the back. Okay, now is it gonna work any better? So the antenna is just just uh where is the antenna? Just throwing out on the floor here. Okay, so I hear that I don't know what they call it, that metallic hum is there. the hum uh, volume the volume control doesn't affect the hum So this radio is operating with a wire antenna and it's picked up one station, uh, 590 in Toronto. That's the strongest uh, station up here. Um, if this radio had a proper loop antenna on it, uh, it looks like it never did. It didn't, it didn't, uh, it, it, there, there wasn't one as part of the radio when they sold it. Um, but if you put a proper loop antenna on here, this thing would do a lot better, I'm sure. Of course, the stronger signal you feed into the radio, the better 
sound's going to come out of the speaker. The surprising thing is it won't pick up 640. 640 is slightly weaker, uh, and but yet it, it doesn't show up at all. Well, that's kind of interesting. So, but basically, I don't think the radio's uh, performance changed with the two two switched, which says something, I guess. And listen to that hum. So we got to track down what that hum is. We got to get rid of that crazy hum. That's what's in store in the next video. So thanks a lot for watching, and uh, we'll give this guy another day in here anyway.